From the news team at LinkedIn, I'm Jesse Hempel, and this is Hello Monday. It's our show about the changing nature of work and how that work is changing us. There are some people who like stability, who enjoy working on one thing for a long time. And then there are people who start things. It's in their nature. No matter what they're doing, they're always thinking about something that doesn't exist yet and should. Today's guest is just such a guy. Even in his first job as a doorman, he was thinking about how to upsell, improve things, develop a side hustle. I was always trying to innovate upon the experience of doormanning, and my boss at the time was just like, bruh, can you just open the door? That's John Henry, and no, he couldn't just open the door. This has turned out to be one of his greatest skills. John's a hustler. He's already sold a company, helped grow a venture capital firm, and hosted a show for Viceland aptly called Hustle. Now he's helping build a new company, and he's only 28. John has something important to teach us about taking risks. He's not a guy who was born with a silver spoon in his mouth, but he's someone who's learned to trust himself, to figure things out, and this has served him well as he's built his career as an entrepreneur. Here's John Henry. My journey started in uptown Manhattan (laughs) in Washington Heights, which is a very Dominican uh, uh, neighborhood. And you can often hear bachata and people will break out in song and dance. And it was New York in the 90s. My mom worked as a custodian, but really she would sell super soakers in the park on on hot New York City summers. And then she would sell seafood to the guys hanging out the rest of the time. And my pops you know, drove cabs and did all kinds of stuff, but really was a presser and a dry cleaner. And so that's kind of my DNA. By the time I went to high school, though, my mom had gotten a job in Florida. So we migrated down there. And I also went to a public high school, but I went to a public high school in a more affluent neighborhood, not because we live there, but actually because my mom was a custodian in that school district. And one of the perks that you get is that your kids can go to school there. So all of a sudden I went from like urban concrete jungle to like beautiful Jensen Beach, Florida, where everyone had custom homes and like it was all kinds, you know, it was definitely a big shock for me. At first it was intimidation and then it was amazement when I went to some of these kids' homes. (laughs) And then it was bitterness that I didn't have it. And then it was acceptance that it is what it is. And then it was gratitude that we're starting from scratch and I have the opportunity to build it myself. So that was the full range, obviously a kind of a crazy range. But, you know, as a kid, if like I was into playing guitars and I had to get a used, you know, sh- guitar from wherever. And, you know, any times my friends were into any hobbies, they would, you know, money was not an obstacle. So they could just get the coolest things all the time. And so, yeah, of course, you're going to be upset and bitter at that. But as time went on, though, I realized uh, their love for the craft was not the same because there was no struggle in acquiring, you know, these things. And so... I saw how it actually nurtured in me a resilience, a commitment, a love of craft, and a thoughtfulness that I was not finding in my peers that came from that background. And I knew early, I was 17 years old, that if I just locked in on any craft with good intention, that um, my background that I thought was my curse at the time, I knew would turn into my greatest blessing. So John, it's pretty profound that someone could come to that realization, not in the middle of your life when you're like 40 years old, but when you're 17. Mm. What's that about? I think it had a lot to do with a particular book that I read that is a little controversial. Now I'm finding in my older life, but formative, powerful for me. And that book was The Fountainhead by Ayn Rand, whom I've come now to understand that A lot of her ideology is flawed in the sense that it's not empathetic enough, but what it impounds and and, and asserts into the reader that's fortunate enough to be receptive to the message and get captured in this world is it teaches you about individualism to the extreme. Like, Mm -hmm. hey, it's on you. No externalities. Doesn't matter where you come from, what, like it's on you and it just... And it instills in you a love for the aspiration of a greatness. It resonated with me. And I think when something resonates with you, it's a clue about you, right? Like I feel like external things serve only as a mirror back into our own conscious. And maybe someone else would have read the same book and not felt that way or whatever. And I became, I can say, obsessive about craft 
from that age on and I cut out intentionally. I removed my TV from my room, reduced social life. I had no social, like I became focused at that point. So John, what did you do next once you finished high school? I had the, these little town blues, these little town blues. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to go back to New York City. I went back to New York City and I was just prepared to be swept up by the energy of the city and the, the allure of that you could apply yourself here and make it in any craft that if you were going to make it somewhere, it would be here, you know, that whole thing. It yeah, sounds moved, so good. Yeah, it sounds good. <laughs> but then when good. you're 17 and broke and just arriving for the first time, and I don't know how broke you were, but that my experience was that the city kind of swept me up. Yep. I would largely agree with that. I moved back. It was me, my pops, and my brother, and we had a we got a one-bedroom apartment in Washington Heights, so it was like homecoming, right? It was certainly a trip, but I had this drive in me that I felt like, hey, it's going to rest on my shoulders if I could build anything here. Let's see what can be done. Yeah, yeah, so that's what I did. And you did a number of different things, right, for work? Yep, yep. I um, did all kinds of stuff. I sold uh, leather jackets. <laughs> that didn't last, last long. Uh, I was a bag boy at a dry cleaner because my pops, I mentioned, was a presser at a dry cleaner. So he got me a little hookup, and I got fired from that as well. I tried to do multi-level marketing. <laughs> that just wasn't my jam, so I left that. Uh, yeah. I felt a little cultish. What were you selling? Me. Uh, I was selling knives. Mm. Cutco. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There you go. <laughs> they had like the sharpest <laughs> knives in the world or whatever. And then I found a job as a doorman. And that was sufficient stimuli to keep me interested, to keep me curious, and um, to keep me meeting people mm -hmm. and offer a little bit of stability that I definitely needed to help my parents out. That's a, That can be a very good job. It can be a very Excellent safe job, job mm -hmm. right? Yep. People are there for a long time. And um, if you're fortunate enough to work in a union building, I wasn't, but some of those doormen go on to make like probably I would say 50, 55K on salary. But then the real bonus is like for Christmas. And if you're in a big building, you sometimes make 14, 20K uh, a year from just the Christmas bonuses. So, you know, some doormen, walk away with 70 to 100K, honestly, in the year. And it's a very, very respectable living for sure. But I can see how it didn't match with your DNA. I mean, you <laughs> described growing up in a family of people who are hustling, your mom's selling in the park on weekends. How did you figure out that it was time to do something else? <laughs> um, when my little uh, ideas and adventures were, were definitely at odds with the job. I mean, I was always trying to innovate upon the experience of doormanning. And my boss at the time was just like, bruh, can you just open the door? Like I, I literally made a little pitch and showed it to my uh, then manager. If we would have an iPad to greet the residents and like take uh, uh, inventory of their mood and how their day was and just like get a macro level understanding of like how we could, you know, tailor our welcome to the residents. Like literally I have, uh, I probably still have the pitch somewhere. I can see you doing that. And I can see your colleagues being like, no, we open the door. We say hello. Yeah, it was like a little overboard. And then I tried to, this was before Uber was kind of big. So residents would always call down to me and say, hey, could you book a, a cab for me? So like I invented this little hustle where I found a taxi cab company that I redirected all the volume to on the cab that they gave me a commission uh, on what they made. And we, we had a log and I would like train the other doorman to always log who we call and like always call this number. So that did that. I mean, <laughs> a lot of little things like that. Where and was the, the joy in that for you, John? I just, I'm watching you. I, of course, our <laughs> listeners can't see this, but I can see this. You are smiling so big, right? <laughs> Like, what's driving that? I guess I like to make things better, cooler. Like, I like to conceive something in my mind and, like, put a little sweat behind it and see it come about. And improving upon existing experiences was something that I felt was, a like, a nice way to do it. So what gave you the confidence to take one of those things and turn it into a, a company, to, to leave the job and, and try to make something of it? Necessity. Um, I was fired from my job. Eventually, it became too much. And uh, the building owner and the property manager was like, we like you, but uh, this is not what we pay you for. So they cut me. And I thought that my 
life was over. Oh no, you know, I love this building that I was in and the residents loved me. And they actually also axed me in early December. So right before my Christmas bonus. That's brutal. That sucks, doesn't it? I was like, bro, at least fire me afterwards. But you know, I was working on a little side hustle at the time that I didn't know what I would end up locking, locking in on, but it was one of the residents had a franchise of dry cleaners. So he had a big dry cleaning facility, which is very expensive to put up. But he allowed me access to the facility and he said, hey, if you just convince people to give you their clothes, just run it back to me. I'll charge you wholesale rate. You charge the market rate and you make the spread. So like for a suit, it costs a regular customer $12. So if I can convince you to give me the suit that you have on and I'll dry clean it for you, I would bring it to my mentor, Hugo. He would clean it for me for $4. I would charge you 12. I made eight bucks. Like, all right, cool. Well, you're not going to get rich off of eight bucks, but I like those numbers. And if I can convince a number of people. And so that's what I was working on. And and I was falsely accused, by the way, of trying to convert the residents in the building to use my service. I was not doing that. But I think it was a convenient thing to pin me on. And I got axed. I just want to stop on that one second, because Mm -hmm. I I so appreciate how freely you talk about being fired from this job. In fact, it turned out to be probably one of the better things that happened for you in your professional life. Mm-hmm. I was fired from a job early too in high school and I was quite bad at the job for different reasons entirely, but I carried so much shame about that for mm. so long mm. rather than taking it as information. Oh, this isn't, this isn't what you're supposed to be doing or you would mm. be doing better at it. And I'm just curious if you've told your story a lot now, a lot publicly, mm-hmm. did you always include that part or did it take you a while to feel comfortable sharing it? I would say that, firstly, I empathize with that very much. And I think it was a little bit easier for me to buck this job and say, yeah, I was fired for a number of reasons. One, I found an outlet through which I could then fuel that I'm going to get you back kind of energy. But B, because it was a job that I didn't care so much about. But when I was running that dry cleaning gig and I started servicing the film and the television industry, you know, I picked up production accounts. I was fired off of a number of accounts and that took me a while to speak about because there is a shame that comes with it for sure. You know, I got thrown off the set of a show called The Following with Kevin Bacon because I ruined the principal actress's blouse. And when she gave me the order, she was like, hey, just make sure you, you care after this blouse. And then I, it was a huge order, maybe 200 pieces. And I returned and there was one piece that the dry cleaner that I was using was like, hey, there's one that's compromised. Like, All right, no worries. And I returned it. And then she was like, hey, where's the principal actress's blouse? And I slowly realized as I was going through the garment rack that it was that one and there was a there was a hole there and she was furious and she threw me off the set and the word spread. And yeah, there it definitely is a shame that comes with that. And how long did it take you to get over it? Well, about two years ago. So I guess about 20 years after the event, I realized while talking to a job coach that it was still holding me back psychologically back mm. there, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. But then again, it was... It was different, right, John? Like, for me, that job wasn't in line with anything that I thought was my passion or my career. Mm. And for you, the doorman job probably wasn't that. But this next piece, like getting wrong, the thing that you're most passionate about doing, like, I could imagine that would be sore in a different way. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely is. It definitely is because it challenges my own sense of self-worth and competency and ability and it makes you question if what you're doing, you should be doing. And you have all these thoughts, like emotions and doubts and fears can all instantly be triggered when we have a shortcoming. We're going to take a quick break here. We'll hear what happens to John's dry cleaning business after this. And we're back. Today's guest is serial entrepreneur John Henry. When John was just 21, he sold his dry cleaning business to a large competitor, The payout wasn't huge by tech company standards, but it was validation that John could have an idea, pour himself into it, and create something of real value. It changed my confidence. It let me know that I could start something, build it, sell something. The full cycle of completion. And I did it without a college degree. I dropped out of community college my very first semester. I did it without a last name. I did it without coming from a zip code. I did it with no cash. I started it with a check that I had for my doorman gig. So it was 900 bucks. I did it with heart. I did it with tenacity and getting through days where I was literally bleeding from my nose. I was so stressed that I didn't know I was going to make payroll. Where did you find the people 
who helped you and who helped you get smarter and took you to the next level after you sold your business? I found them along the way. And I think that that's one really key lesson that I learned. People look for mentors on the blogs and on the books, but in reality, they're on the path. I found a lot of people that you probably couldn't find elsewhere that were doing the work every day. And in so doing the work, you find folks like this. They became largely my mentors. And then over time, when I discovered producing content, that became a really, really fascinating outlet for me where I could take some of the things that I was going through daily and learning from my mentors and applying in real time and then sharing in real time and having the vulnerability to share in real time. And if I lost a deal, said I lost a deal, you know, just like something about the way that I was sharing very vulnerably, I think started speaking to folks. And now I have no shortage of people that, you know, I'm connected to, but yeah, it came from like a very isolated place first that led to somehow a lot of connection. Well, that gets to what happens next. And the sharing content piece is, it, is a big part of that, right? I mean, mm. you, you really put yourself out there early on. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it started when I was running the dry cleaner and I got thrown off a set of the following and I felt like, wow, I lost 40% of my revenue losing one client. I probably should go about trying to build for consumers. And so like, you know, regular direct to consumer. And I said, well, how do I do that? And so I printed a bunch of flyers and then I paid some people to post the flyers everywhere. And there was a snowstorm the next day. I was like, okay, that's not necessarily a super effective way to reach people these days. So I just started getting more hip to how to reach people. And then I discovered the power of content. It felt a lot more authentic. And it turns out it's correct in my view to produce content and actually have nothing to sell and just produce for producing sake because that's how you build with a person. You know, you can always smell when someone wants to connect with you because they want something and it feels weird. But when you just connect with someone, you just dap them up and you're hanging out and you just get to know them over a long time, you build context, familiarity, trust. And so that is how I got into content. It was a philosophy that I had around the way to connect with people and the way that business as a whole was moving. After John sold his business, he joined a group of investors launching Harlem Capital, it started as a small endeavor and grew into a multi-million dollar fund that invests in diverse founders across the country. Me and my partners, whom are really just friends that came together and thought that, hey, what if we put a little bit of cash to work? You know, people do it in the public markets, but private markets is a little bit more interesting, but you can't really have access unless you have a lot of money. What if I wrote a check for $2,000, you wrote a check for $2,000, and you wrote a check for, t and we grouped up enough people that we had a check for $20,000, and we maybe can convince a startup to let us in if we came in as a single unit. We did that, and you know we got to work, and we invested in some things that definitely didn't work out, already closed down, lost money for sure. But then we started investing in some startups that were growing a little bit more quickly. And I found that the dialogue that I was having with the startups was a lot more enriching and fulfilling than like smaller scale ops, because I had already come from that. I had already done that. What was new to me was like the idea of investing in media and all those other kind. You speak with people that are just super ambitious and they want to change the world. And then we started discovering, wow, there's a lot of white guys coming to us. What if we just kind of focused on diverse founders? And so then we developed the thesis around it and we developed the brand around it. And we made one investment, two investments, six investments. And I definitely, we didn't even have that much cash, but like scrounging up whatever I could. And sometimes on some deals, I only put in a thousand bucks. And then on some deals I could put in three because I, I was a little bit more excited about that one and saved up a little bit more or whatever. And we did that but by the way. it was your own the... money for the most part. It wasn't on behalf of anyone. 100%. It was our own cash. And we did that over the course of two years too. So it's not like I had 3K times six, like in, in a short period, over a long period. And then, yeah, we thought, hey, then let's do this. Let's do it. Let's raise a fund. Let's convince other people to give us their money so that we can give it to invest it in other folks. There were four of us, all of color, all under 30, all first time fund managers in the riskiest asset class, which is venture in this riskiest stage of venture, which is seed stage, and investing in founders that people thought weren't as qualified as the typical view of a venture founder. So we were investing in 
underrepresented founders, minorities, and women back companies. So it was like the riskiest things all compounded into one. And here we were like, invest in us. Uh, so that's what Harlem Capital was. And it was a long time of pounding pavement. And, you know, we uh, were not able to raise much money, but there was one woman who was our first million dollar check. And that really was a domino effect. Let's just, let's just qualify. This is 2018. This is not like back then and a Correct. decade or two. This is like a couple years ago. There's a couple years ago. We started in 2018. And by the time it was the end of 2019, after a lot of meetings and pounding pavement and what have you, we were able to close on a $40 million fund, $40.3 million, 40 million fund one, anchored by TPG, institutional investors like Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in the state of Michigan and Vanderbilt Clinic and all kinds of stuff. And we found ourselves in a position where we were managing capital for large institutions that had most of their money parked in safe things, but had some of their money parked into riskier things that could potentially yield big impact, such as Harlem Capital. And so we got into the venture business. My dream came true. Everything I ever wanted. You know, we closed on the capital. We we're in a position to make a lot of impact. And then I ran into my age old friend, which was this feeling of, I got to do something different. <laughs> and it just is the most ludicrous thing. But I could tell because my excitement that I have presently, for example, was no longer present in my day to day. And I had realized that this venture that we started had grown up and, you know, it was time to button up and lock in for the next decade if you're really going to go on this journey. And it was really a moment of reflection for me because can you imagine how scary it is to fight for everything you ever wanted, get there and realize that maybe that's not what you wanted? What would you do if you knew that if you just shut up and walked the path, you would get rich likely? And that so piece, that piece is the confusing part because every outside signal in the world tells us that that's the point. That if you have the possibility of getting rich in front of you, mm -hmm. of course, that is the option you pursue. Yep. And I was faced with that and I was staring right in the face at it. I got equity, like all that. And um, I decided that if it's not lighting me up every day, fully capturing my imagination, that I would make the scarier choice as I have done so consistently in my life. Right. And I did it again and I uh, stepped down and the mission is in beautifully competent hands with my partners and walked away feeling empowered because now I have more skills than ever, more access to network than ever. And, you know, I just, I know more, I can do more like, wow, it was exciting. Like, what can I do now? And then I finally stepped into what that is. And I'm really excited for that. So that is your startup. And are you, are you still in stealth mode or are you talking about what it is? No, we're, we're out and about. It's called Loop. We close a three and a quarter million dollar seed round at Loop. And what we're doing is we're tackling structural bias in insurance, which I love this move because I got no business being in this business. And I love that. It turns out insurance is very structurally biased because they price people based on their demographic data. So like your income, your education, your occupation determines your price. Right. And we're like, that we're never going to ask you about race, but we would like your zip code, please. Yeah, right. What do you think the implications are around that? And hey, what's your credit and what's your occupation? And, you know, do you own your home? Like all those things determine your score. But we have the technology to dynamically measure the actual measure of risk, which is how you drive and where you drive. So we created this really cool cutting edge methodology that enables us to do just that. We can bypass all the structurally biased stuff, measure what matters. And we decided to create our own vertically integrated insurance company, like the new version of Progressive uh, Loop. We're a public benefit corporation, so we measure profit and purpose, you know, and we're building a brand for communities that have been overlooked and underinsured. Um, and we're doing it in the blind spots of large insurers that don't believe that this method can work. So John, you're saying we again. So who's the we? <laughs> yes, yes. So I am joined by a, a wonderful co-founder and co-CEO. And we're up to a team of 10 already. So we're rocking and rolling. And I am so excited to be on this journey. I feel much like, to bring it full circle, much like how I felt when 
I started my very first business, which was that dry cleaner way back when. And I can sense, just like how we had at Harlem Capital, when people became way more excited about this thing, it wasn't even about capital, it was just like changing the face of entrepreneurship. We're doing, we're creating fair insurance for all at Loop and I can feel people be energized and people are excited to be represented in insurance. And when have you ever seen an insurance carrier run by people of color and international people and my co-founder's a woman and like things like that. Well, that's awesome. You know, John, in preparing for this conversation, I saw in a couple of different places the way that you spoke about like one aspect of purpose for you being connected to building the kind of intergenerational wealth for people of color that has benefited so many white people over the generations so that they those people that you went to high school with simply had the resources from the start sure. to be able to do a lot of this stuff. So now you're 28, curious if that feels old or young to you. <laughs> and and I'm curious like what your sense of purpose is now. Yeah, I feel driven to change systems that haven't been rethought through or reconsidered in time that have adverse effects on people and that will not change if they're not intentionally changed. And I think the summer protests after the George Floyd events really was a shock moment for me when I realized these systems are not only present, but they are here and they weigh on us daily and they will not change. We have to change it. Our generation, us right now with what we have and we got to swing big. So that's what drives me now, challenging these systems and building our own. Awesome. Well, thank you, John. That was really fun. Thank I you. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, I also enjoyed it. That was John Henry, serial entrepreneur. To learn more about his latest venture, visit loopinsure.co. This week on Office Hours, we'll be talking about hustle and drive. At your core, what motivates you to push beyond 100%? Where do you feel compelled to give more than your all and why? Bring your thoughts to this week's Office Hours. We'll be convening Wednesday afternoon at 3 p.m. Eastern on the LinkedIn News page. You can find us by following LinkedIn News or emailing Hello Monday at LinkedIn.com for the link. If you like the show, please take a moment right now to rate us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. I know I ask a lot. And there's a reason for this. Each rating helps us surface the show to more people. It's an easy way to help us out a lot. Hello Monday is a production of LinkedIn. The show is produced by Sarah Storm. Joe DiGiorgi mixed our show. Florencia Iriando is head of original audio and video. Dave Pond is our technical director. Michaela Greer, Samantha Roberson, Carrington York, and Victoria Taylor bring their hustle to our podcasting endeavor week after week. Our music was composed just for us by the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. You also heard music from Poddington Bear. Dan Roth is the editor-in-chief of LinkedIn. I'm Jesse Hempel. Our show's back next Monday. Thanks for listening.